Hello, and welcome to the Norton Museum of Art. My name is Michael Johnson, and I'm a docent here at the Norton. It is my pleasure to introduce you to one of my favorite pieces in the collection, Diana and Acteon with Pan and Syrinx, by the Italian artist Valerio Costello. I'll tell you a little bit about the artist shortly, but first, let's look at this wonderful painting. The oil painting is quite large, almost five and a half feet high and over eight feet wide. In it, we see a landscape with two groups of people clustered in the foreground, very close to the picture frame, with a turbulent sky in the background. The figures are all framed between two clusters of trees. The sunlight appears to be coming from the right and slightly behind us, as Castello uses the light almost like small spotlights, highlighting various parts of the main actors in the scene, causing our eyes to dance around the canvas. Our eyes are immediately drawn to the dominant figure of a woman in the center of the painting. As identified in the title of the painting, she is Diana, Roman goddess of the hunt. How do we know this? You can see that she holds a bow in her left hand, and on her head, she wears a tiara, topped with a crescent moon, which is her symbol. Although primarily associated with hunting, Diana was also revered as the goddess of the woods, children and childbirth, fidelity, chastity, the moon, and wild animals. Her worshipers believe she had the power to talk to woodland animals and even control their movements and behavior, skills which would become important very soon. Behind her stand two nymphs, beautiful female spirits who appear to be engaged in conversation. Below the outstretched right arm of the goddess, we see the winged figure of Cupid holding his famous bow. Diana appears to be gesturing and looking across the painting towards a young woman struggling in the arms of two male figures. Here we see a story recounted in Ovid's Metamorphoses, the well-known collection of ancient Roman mythological tales. The beautiful nymph Syrinx had become an obsession for Pan. Syrinx was a follower of Diana, and like her, had vowed to remain chaste. Pan was a satyr, something of a half-man, half-goat. According to Ovid, Pan pursued Syrinx, who did not welcome his advances. She ran from him until she came to a river where she appeared to be trapped. In our painting, Pan is assisted by another satyr in his attempt to abduct the nymph. Syrinx prayed to Diana for help, and according to Ovid, just as Pan was about to embrace her, she changed into a cluster of reeds. Castello depicted the scene just before Syrinx's transformation took place. When Pan discovered that he was holding nothing but marsh reeds, he sighed in disappointment, causing the wind to blow through the reeds. He was enchanted by the sound, believing it to be the beautiful cry of his beloved Syrinx. If you've ever blown across the top of a glass bottle, you can imagine the sound. Pan cut the reeds free and fashioned a set of pipes so that he could have her with him always. To this day, you can go online and buy a set of rather inexpensive Pan pipes like the set I have here. On the right side of the painting, we see a young man holding a hunting spear. He looks at the goddess while stretching his right hand down to the agitated hunting dog at his side, as if to calm the excited beast. This is Acteon, whose tragic tale is also recounted in Ovid's Metamorphoses. According to the Roman text, while hunting one day, Acteon happened upon Diana and her nymphs bathing. Diana was renowned as a virgin goddess and was outraged that a man had seen her unclothed. As she did not have her bow at hand, she was unable to kill Acteon directly. Instead, she caught up a handful of water from around her and threw it in his face. As the story says, and I quote, as she sprinkled his hair with the vengeful drops, she added these words, harbingers of his coming ruin. Now you may tell, if you can tell that is, of having seen me naked. Without more threats, she gave the horns of a mature stag to the head she had sprinkled, lengthening his neck, making his ear tips pointed, changing feet for hands, long legs for arms, and covering his body with a dappled hide. And then she added fear." End of quote. In some versions of the tale, rather than throwing water on him, Diana shoots Acteon with an arrow, which turns him into a stag. Whichever version of the story you prefer, the end result is the same. Acteon dashed away and was soon spotted by his hunting dogs. Unaware that the stag was their master, they chased it, surrounded the animal, and tore it to pieces. Castello's painting does not show Acteon's transformation. However, the dog at his side seems agitated as if to foreshadow his master's demise. 
Those familiar with the Norton Museum will recognize this as the same story beautifully portrayed by the bronze statues that grace the original entrance to the museum on the east side of the building. These statues were purchased by museum founder Ralph Norton from noted sculptor Paul Manship and have graced the eastern doors since the museum's opening in 1941. When you next come to the Norton Museum, I encourage you to walk around to the eastern side to view these amazing sculptures. While presenting this painting on tours, I often ask our guests why they think Castello chose to include these two very different stories in the same painting. Well, the fact is these tales have something very much in common. They both address the theme of chastity's triumph over lust. Diana triumphs over Acteon's transgression of seeing her unclothed, albeit accidentally, while Syrinx escapes the unwanted pursuit of the satyr Pan. A companion piece or pendant to this work titled The Legend of St. Genevieve of Brabant is in the collection of the Wadsworth Anthenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. It depicts a scene from a medieval legend that illustrates the theme of fidelity and love triumphing over deception. We believe that these two works would have been exhibited together by their original owner in the 17th century. So let's talk about the artist. Valerio Castello was born in Genoa, Italy in 1624. His father was Bernardo Castello, an Italian painter of the late Mannerist style. His father passed away at the age of 72 when Valerio was only six years old. The young Valerio copied drawings in his late father's studio and studied works by painters known for their emotional power and vivid colors. His skill was noted by his patrons who arranged his apprenticeship to local Genoese painters. His painting was also influenced by the Flemish master, Anthony van Dyck, who arrived in Genoa in 1621 and remained there for six years. Van Dyck provided Castella with a model of an artist of effortless technical skill, as well as a vocabulary of elegant pose and gesture and the force of powerful color juxtapositions. All these qualities are apparent in Diana and Acteon with Pan and Syrinx, a work of extraordinary dynamism and a textbook example of Genoese Baroque painting renowned for its dramatic realism. Relatively few of Castello's paintings are dated. However, it's believed he painted this work probably around 1650 at the height of his mature phase and just a few years before his untimely death at the age of 39. At the time he executed the Norton painting, the Republic of Genoa was at its height, enjoying extraordinary growth based on international trade and banking. The economic boon taking place proved beneficial to local artists due to the many commissions for the decoration of palaces and churches. In the last decade of his life, Castello received many of these lucrative commissions. Patrons reportedly admired his paintings of mythological and religious subjects. His frescoes of glowing color and dramatic illusionism in various Genoese palaces made him quite famous. As eloquently written by Castello's biographer in 1674, from foreign countries, including all of France, orders for his pictures came to Genoa, and this raised their prices too high for words. Well, I'd say we're quite fortunate to have one of his works in our collection here at the Norton. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on one of the highlights of the European collection at the Norton Museum of Art. The next time you visit the museum, I encourage you to take the stairs or elevator up to the third floor, which houses the older European art. Here, you'll be able to see this great painting in person, along with many other fascinating works. Until then, I thank you for your attention, and I can't wait to see you at the Norton.